Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on our series of webcasts. My name is Dominic Chow. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Echelon Wealth Partners. And today's topic is about resilience during turbulent times. Of course, I think that uh, resonates with all of us right now as we are uh, dealing with COVID and the impacts on our economy, our families, um, culture and behavior, which is of particular interest to me. And for today also uh, in relation to that is the arts. And so I am really, really pleased to be joined by Matthew Loden, who is the CEO of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. This has been um, a fantastic opportunity for us to get some insights from, from this uh, very experienced professional. Uh, Matthew, you uh, were appointed the CEO on, I believe, April 30th, 2018. And uh, Matthew came from the Philadelphia Orchestra, where he was since 2012. And previous to that, uh, held senior positions at the Aspen Music Festival, the Shepherd School of Music at Rice University. He's a, a renowned administrator in the arts, a musician, a teacher, uh, where he's built a reputation of, of being able to raise funds for the arts. He had double digit increases in the annual fund at the Philadelphia Orchestra and balanced budgets throughout his tenure. And so we are so privileged to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's great to be here. Um, I, I always love uh, talking about resilience and the arts and all things um, musical life. So um, it's, a, it's a terrific opportunity and I appreciate the invitation. Fantastic, fantastic. So, you know, we talk about resilience and I, I looked up the definition and, and the Mayo Clinic says it's the ability to adapt to difficult situations, adversity, trauma, and significant stress. So as we think about the Toronto Symphony Orchestra and your leadership of it, I thought maybe we can start with really understanding how this even relates to the arts and the orchestra itself. I imagine that resilience is part of an orchestra's DNA. And what, what comments do you have about that? Oh yeah, it, it, um, I think the resilience in the symphony orchestra is, is, is multi-layered. Um, if you start with the individual musicians themselves, and the way in which we're trained, you start from a, like if, if you're a member of the TSO, the likelihood of you winning one of those positions is actually statistically smaller than you winning a spot on the NBA, right? That's so incredible. These, jo these jobs are very hard to come by. So you have um, a large number of extraordinarily talented people who ultimately win them which means that they've probably been engaged with their instrument one way or another since the time they were probably three <laughs> or four years old, right? Right. And one of the things that you're taught as a musician is to very quickly face your fear and to very quickly identify what it is that isn't working and figure out how to fix it. Don't pay attention to all the stuff that's beautiful that you do easily because you maybe have natural talent and that phrase was easy to happen, have happened. Yeah, sorry for the, the sunlight, it's wonderful. What do you have to do in order to fix the problem? And so we've got a collection of almost 100 musicians in the Toronto Symphony Orchestra who are used to the high wire act of performing where you're not allowed to actually make mistakes, but when you do make a mistake, you have to figure out how in real time to recover, right? That skill set of always moving forward, you have a piece of music, it starts here, you're telling a story, it ends here. You don't get to stop in the middle of the story and say, oops, sorry, um, let me go back and play that phrase again because it wasn't in tune, right? If you play it out of tune, you have to figure out what comes next. So that at a fundamental level is kind of how a lot of musicians are wired. So institutionally, what we've tried to do is to recognize number one, that we are we're an organization that in the past has been modeled on a 19th century European army. We're very hierarchical. We have a conductor who's kind of like a general. We have section leaders who manage the troops. And it, when it works well, it's a benevolent dictatorship that's extraordinary. When it doesn't work well, the hierarchy of the way that we tend to be organized can, can make it bureaucratic and slow and not nimble and not able to react to outside forces like a global pandemic. 
Right. So luckily, we've been spending a lot of time on the idea of culture, the idea of communication. Wrapped up in that, of course, is resilience. How do we set ourselves up so that we can react quickly, move to the next things, learn quickly, and not just make a series of assumptions that the world is the way it's always going to be, and so we can program something three years from now because five years ago that was successful, like any business, right? Right. No, absolutely. So, um, so I, I don't, I, I don't know if that kind of gives a a, a sense of. Um, you know, resiliency within within the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. When when, well, I'll, I'll give you another example. When the pandemic hit, March the 13th was the first concert that we had to cancel, and that was last season. And then we wound up canceling 39 concerts at the last quarter of last season. And then we were one of the first orchestras in North America in the summertime to actually make the difficult decision to cancel the entire season that we're living in now. So our 2020-2021 season was meant to be the launching of our new music director, Gustavo Jimeno. We've spent two years, two years programming this season of about 160 concerts. Last summer, when we decided to cancel it, we went through a very rigorous process with the senior leadership group to figure out what was our decision matrix, what were the pros and cons, what were the things in ambiguity that we had to pay attention to? We didn't know when the pandemic would end and we didn't know what the revenues would be or not be, but we knew that the most important thing we could do for the success of the organization was to make a decision that would then allow us to tell our patrons and our base what we were going to do and who we were going to continue to be. And because we made that decision early, we could communicate with our people in a very successful and strategic way and it meant that we've been able to kind of keep things together rather than dying of a thousand cuts over the course of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. How did you keep everyone across that, your whole organization kind of motivated and, and focused? Uh, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of change. You know, your best laid plans will always face all of these different, um, different levels of lockdown, uh, different messages about what's allowed and what's not allowed. How do you keep the messaging clear and make sure that, you know, even if there is enthusiasm, I, I remember a TED talk from Angela Duckworth, Duckworth, and she said, you know, enthusiasm is common, endurance is rare. How do you keep that endurance working for you? Yeah, well, I think in, in, in large part, it, uh, or in some regards, it goes back to kind of what I was talking about with the training of a, of a musician. Um, and Duckworth, She's, she's terrific in what she um, illuminates for people, that you can have talent, but talent is very different from skill, right? And lots of people have talent, and they're deeply unsuccessful with that talent because they haven't figured out how to be either disciplined about developing that talent into a skill that's repeatable, right? Um, and for us at the, at the TSO, the, the, the habit that we have of having very high expectations of ourselves, highly functional professionalized staff, highly functional professionalized uh, group of musicians. We have a mission, we have an understanding of what we're doing that builds a framework for how we um, lead through crisis together. Um, and I think that we had um, a real sense that the pandemic was not our fault but we had an opportunity to react to the pandemic in a way that could expedite some cultural change, could maybe put some new initiatives forward that we otherwise might not be able to actually achieve during the course of a normal season. And those little points of light, those, those things that felt like they were new and they were important because we had talked about them previously being important for the organization, that gave our talent and our skill in habit something to work toward. Um, and so, you know, we're, it's show business at the end of the day, right? Yes. So for yeah. us, the show has to go on. And so that's our, that's our, like our baseline, right? It's not, oh, you know, it's, it's snowing. We better cancel the concert or, oh, mm -hmm. the soloist is sick and not able to play the Tchaikovsky violin concerto. The reality is there's a couple thousand people that have paid money to hear this, figure it out. What are we going to do instead? Right. Um, so we're lucky in that regard that we have that we have that kind of 
instinct and expectation built in. And, and often, as with everything, it boils down to dollars and cents. And in our business context, uh, we, we certainly all are, are facing the realities of, of changing revenue streams and, and different levels of consumer and client demand. Uh, when it comes down to the dollars and cents, you know, you've got the musicians on the one hand, keeping them motivated and focused, and then you've got your, your board and you've got your management team and, and you have all the various stakeholders and patrons. Uh, what have you done about keeping all of that moving forward and having people continue to believe and seeing that there's a, a, a way to continue successfully? Well, it's like in any complex organization, um, communication is the most important thing, right? I mean, like just fundamentally, the way in which you talk to people, how frequently you do it. And it's not just the content of your messaging, but the fact that you're doing it, right? And that you have a codified way of setting expectations for communication channels to work. We're in isolation. That's really hard. Um, we're used to conducting business and seeing each other backstage. We're used to having four concerts a week where we can not only build staff, board, and musicians around a performance, but that we can attract and acquire new people into our world. All of that's not happening now. So internally, what we did very quickly was we established a weekly board meeting during COVID-19. Didn't always have to be long, didn't have to be complicated, but it was, a, it was a, an important touch base. We doubled the number of senior management group meetings and we set structures around them so that one senior group management group meeting would be about strategy and big picture thinking for the next three, six and 18 months going forward. Mm -hmm. And then the other meeting of the week would be sort of a round table, rapid fire, catch up. Here's the things that are going on. Let's just make sure we're all aware. We also established every two weeks, we have an orchestra town hall, which is, which is really surprisingly unusual in the orchestra world. Most of the time, orchest orchestral musicians um, um, are, are, are designed to rehearse, perform, do other things sort of as directed, take the paycheck. I'm being grossly general about this, right? <laughs> Part of their paradigm is usually not spending a lot of time talking to management um, about updates on either finances or new initiatives or COVID-19 safety restrictions for being on stage with plastic barriers, right? But we've got a wonderfully, um, we've got a terrific group of musicians and they, you know, they were hungry for some kind of information to know what is going on, what is our future. So every two weeks, we have about 100 people on a Zoom call um, where we just, we just give very transparent updates. Um, and I think that's maybe the last thing that I would say about the, the leadership component, um, not just communication, but transparency. Um, I think those of us that uh, are lucky enough to be parents, hopefully learned early on that when you have a situation that a child witnesses or is a part of that's complicated or maybe ugly or feels adult the instinct is sometimes to pretend like it's not there or to mollify it or to Disneyfy it or to make it into something that is prettier than the reality. What I've found as a parent that the most successful thing I think you can do in raising your children is to tell them the truth. You know, there, right. certainly there's age appropriateness. So it's not to sound um, patronizing like the orchestra are children and we're the parents, but telling the truth, being transparent, sharing difficult news early and reasonably and practically um, is really important. Uh, so I, I, think, I think communicating and, and communicating in a transparent, honest way is really important in these times. Yeah, that really resonates with me. And it's, uh, it's something that I certainly face with my own children. And it's very challenging to be transparent mm -hmm. in just the right way, because there's right. this fear of overstepping that line of, well, when is, when is being um, candid too candid? Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we make sure that people have a chance to have that dialogue with you? So it sounds like you've been doing a lot of uh, all the right things to, to keep people um, on, on with you on this journey. We've been trying, and luckily we have, um, you know, 
our success can often be measured by our ability to actually perform together. And as long as we can do all of the, the preamble work that leads up to that performance, once the performance happens, that's just invigorating, right? That just, it feels great. We had on November the 13th, we did a live stream directly into a number of high schools throughout Ontario. And it was an open rehearsal where we had a conductor on the podium and we were doing Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. And we had 45 musicians on stage of Roy Thompson Hall, four cameras turned on, everyone socially distanced. So the string players are all wearing masks and the wind and brass players have shields, plexiglass shields between them. Right. And this was the first time in November that we could get that many musicians together to perform something. And it was breathtaking. And the musicians felt re-energized because they're doing what they're designed to do, right? Um, and so I think um, always having that carrot in front of us is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a terrific thing that orchestras are able to take advantage of as we're trying to figure out how to get there, how to get to that carrot. Right, right. Now that's, it'd be interesting to see how that translates into uh, other forms of, of business and, and other organizations as well. I think that's, that's a great uh, point to, to, uh, to suggest there. So what other things are you doing as an orchestra, as an organization um, to be innovative and, and address the market and be able to continue to serve the community and make sure that, um, that there's the ability to interact with, with all of the stakeholders that, that you um, look after and, and interact with? Sure. Well, you know, um, I, I, I never want to discount or diminish the, um, the tragic human toll that COVID-19 has played in, in many of our communities, but there is um, there's a, a kind of opportunity and advantage that symphony orchestras have other have over other kinds of arts organizations in that, yes, we are first and foremost a symphony orchestra of 100 musicians who play works that are designed for 100 musicians to play together as a huge ensemble. But we also have an incredible ability to play solo, duet, trio, quartet, small ensemble, ensemble chamber music that's incredibly flexible, very nimble, and easy to deploy, right? So if you think about a monolithic orchestra of a hundred people not being like kind of like a Titanic. Maybe that's a bad analogy, but <laughs> like an ocean. A bad analogy right now. <laughs> let's say, let's say a, a, a very healthy um, ocean liner that works really well with lots of a uh, lots of booze and, and food on board. So there's the big orchestra, and then there's the, the the special forces kind of small ensemble that you can send out to do different sorts of reconnaissance or to find new points of connectivity in the community, develop new relationships. And one of the things that we've done, um, we knew early on that one of the segments of our community in the GTA that was suffering deeply were, were isolated seniors in long-term um, care homes. And it was, you know, it was just terrible. They, they, they couldn't get anywhere. They couldn't see anyone. No one could come to them. You see all of these pictures of family members at windows on the phone with their loved ones. Mm -hmm. We knew that with the new ways that we were developing our expertise with technology, that we could pretty easily take a musician, either from the Toronto Symphony Orchestra or from our youth orchestra, and pair them with an isolated senior. And in between, we did training with Baycrest, um, which is a, a, a wonderful organization. They basically taught our musicians how to be sensitive to aspects of geriatric care. Like if you were going to do a video performance for an isolated senior and that senior was in early stages of dementia, what should you look for? What should you think about? What should you, what should you expect about your conversation? So what wound up happening was we have these incredible moments where we're able to um, very efficiently and economically use the tool of technology to send our content, which happens to be whatever music is going to be played, into a space where people couldn't otherwise have that individualized experience, and they certainly couldn't get out and have a communal experience around music. And it had, had such a deep impact. The, the, the Ontario Minister of, um, uh, of um, Culture and Tourism uh, like 
she she found out about this program. We showed her a few clips from various videos. She was in tears, and we're trying to figure out it's totally scalable. So like, how do we take this as a as a new paradigm of the way to to work on the mental mm -hmm. health needs of isolated people everywhere? And how do you connect it with music in a relatively simple way? It's kind of like doctors who are doing all of their telemedicine or telemedicine, on a video. Yeah. Exactly. Well, this might be a good time, Matthew. I know we, as we were preparing for this chat and thinking of ideas of, of um, what to share with our, our community, um, there is a, a video clip on YouTube of, of this Baycrest partnership. So maybe this would be a great time to show it. Great. Now let's see if technology works for us. That was excellent. I enjoyed that. That sounded very difficult. You played it beautifully. How old are you? I'm 16 years old. So okay. I've been playing the violin since I was four years old. So for 12 years. Oh my, you must have had a cute little violin then. <laughs> <laughs> I did. It was very tiny. It was about this. Hang it up on the wall. <laughs> I loved it. I, I absolutely loved it. And I, oh, sure. again, I am going to s sing it all night. <laughs> yeah, I heard you singing there. That's great. <laughs> oh, it's it's a great song. Outstanding. That was the icing on the cake. Oh, I love pure Beethoven. Pure Beethoven. I love pure Beethoven. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Liliana. Ellie. Thank you for having me. Um, I wish you all the best and I hope I get to I get a chance to share more music with you in the future. Thank you so much Ellie. You really did a beautiful job and I mean it's, it's so it's outstanding. For us it's like a, a, the beginning of a beautiful day. Wow that was um that's very inspirational. Very yeah. inspirational. It, Congratulations it, um, on, on such a, an important initiative. Well, you know, it's, it's, um, it's one of those things where a lot of wonderful moments came together for us, a lot of deep relationships. And um, the more that we can find our own ways to be of service to people like that in the community beyond, beyond doing incredible concerts at Roy Thompson Hall, um, it, uh, it makes all of us a little bit better, right? Absolutely. It really sets an example for how to keep the spirits up and endure through all of this and, and, this, and the positivity involved in, in all of the things that you're doing. Um, it, it's incredible. So, you know, for our final segment, maybe it's, it's worth talking about the future. Life has changed. Society has changed. Some say permanently. You know, what are What's the future look like for the TSO given, given this environment? And you know, there's obviously the culture shift that we've talked about. Um, what does it mean for the value of the product 
and, and how you carry forward as an orchestra, which is, you know, a very um, traditional institution. We always think about going to Roy Thompson Hall to sit down for um, for a concert. That whole model has has shifted. How much do you think it has shifted, and where is it going? Well, you know, of course, if I, if I had an easy answer to that, um, I would, uh, I'd probably be in your business, right? <laughs> if I could read the tea leaves <laughs> far enough in advance to figure out what, what investment to make where. Um, the reality is, I think that because we're living in the middle of this pandemic, we all are expecting the world to never be the same as it was. I think that People are actually creatures of habit, and there are many, many aspects of what we aspire to do differently that we will not be doing differently, right? And so I think that we are still going to be a culture that is primarily visual, it's primarily geared around the instant gratification and the dopamine rush of clicking different buttons on social media. I think we are a culture that is, um, has been trained to receive entertainment rather than communicate with art. And, and so I think one of, the, one of the challenges that we have outside of just bringing audiences back in a live situation to a live symphony orchestra performance, one of the challenges that we have is trying to figure out how do we continually reaffirm that the value to your question, the value of symphonic music, the value of live classical music, the value of live arts period is unquestionably one of the greatest things that we actually have to offer each other in our communities. Um, one of the, I, I'll point to a specific example. We have um, um, on Sunday night, we're launching publicly a new partnership with Against the Grain where we're doing a reimagined Handel's Messiah. Um, and everyone knows Handel's Messiah. It's something that comes out every Christmas with every orchestra in the world, just about. It is a very traditional, biblical, Western Christian oratorio. And there's ways of doing it. And what we've done is the orchestra, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, plays all of the notes, plays all of the music. Above that, though, we've gone across Canada in all 12 provinces, and we have worked with choirs and BIPOC artists. And um, we have different languages being sung. We have Indigenous languages being sung, doing the solo voices of the Messiah. And it's shot in an incredibly wonderful, compelling video um, it's like a videographic, right? It's, it's just, it's, um, it's a totally different way of looking at the Messiah. That is an outcome of this very specific time that otherwise we probably would have said, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's risky, right? That's going to cost too right. much money. There's no real return on it. Yes, it's wonderful. It will check off some boxes for our important work around DEI efforts, but meh. Instead, we double down on it and it is, it's going to be phenomenal. So I think there will be moments like that, that, um, that continue to be a result of how we're reacting to this world we've lived through. Um, it might be that people have a different tolerance for technology in the concert hall itself, but the, mm -hmm. you know, you, you could imagine um, a, a concert guide when you sit down in a seat that is on your phone. Uh, and I mean, those exist. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in Philadelphia with that kind of product. Um, technology is, is part of the answer, but the reality is, and I think, again, to your value question, what we offer as a performing arts organization is that ability to demonstrate what human talent and skill and resilience and artfulness can actually do to communicate to other people. We can, you can be astounded by what someone can do on stage all by themselves with a box of wood and some strings attached, right? And that's never going to change. And even if we do more and more programs online, we're not going to make enough money on that to make it sustainable. There's just not a model that's going to exist because right. the experience is not the same, right? right. It's, it's not as multidimensional. So I'm looking, I'm frankly, you know, I'm 
super glad there's a vaccine. I'm ready to be on the other side of all of this. Uh, but I'm also really looking forward to, to discovering what those new moments are going to be for the TSO. Well, I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, re-engaging <clears throat> as an audience member. And I'm really excited about all the cool things that you and, and the orchestra are doing. So we're, uh, we're at time. Uh, this moved really quickly. It's, it's uh, such an interesting topic. And you've shared with us so many interesting ideas and guidance for how to be resilient in these turbulent times. You've set a great example for us. So I want to thank you again very much, Matthew, for joining us. It's been our privilege to have you. And um, I, I wish you luck. Although I know it's not luck, it's it's grit and it's hard work. <laughs> and, and you guys certainly have that. Thank you so much, Dom. It's wonderful to see you and to spend a little bit of time talking about this stuff. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll see you soon for a live performance. And meanwhile, everybody go to the website, check out all of our on-demand programs and uh, support your local arts and culture, please. Okay, thanks very much, sir. Thank you.